Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so in this talk, I'll be uh, presenting to you our findings about uniform convergence in deep learning. So uniform convergence is the most popular learning theoretic tool that has been used to understand and explain generalization in deep learning. And we will highlight some serious limitations um, about this tool. OK, so what do we know about uh, uh, conventional uniform convergence in the past two years? So first of all, we know that um, if you were to compute the standard uniform convergence bound, you will uh, end up computing the complexity of all functions in, your, uh, in the function class represented by a deep network. And this will be vacuous because it will boil down to a parameter count dependent quantity. And these papers uh, from a few years back proposed a solution to address this, which was to refine these uniform convergence bounds in a way that you incorporate uh, information about the algorithm and the data distribution. So if, if you know how, what sort of implicit regularization is happening, you can encode them um, and apply uniform convergence on a smaller class of hypothesis. And the hope was that this would yield a tighter bound by depending on, um, say, weight norms of the network. And this triggered a huge variety of novel uh, uniform convergence-based bounds over the last few years, uh, ranging from many different kinds of tools like pack base, even Rademacher complexity, compression, um, uh, and so on. Uh, but, the, but the issue still remains, which is that we don't have a bound that fully explains generalization. All these bounds uh, record an improvement in some criteria or, or the other, but at the same time fall short of some other criteria. So in this talk, on top of these issues, we highlight two other um, issues, which I will summarize now. So the first, our first finding is that there are cases where um, it, there are cases in deep learning where the test error improves with the training set size, as you can see there, um, and this is expected. But at the same time, the generalization bounds themselves they increase with the training data set size. And this happens even when there is no, absolutely no label noise. Uh, and this is quite counterintuitive, because if you think about it, what this bound is telling me is that af if I were to add more training data points to the, da to the data set, the algorithm doesn't perform any better and is just probably memorizing these data points. So the takeaway, the first takeaway here is that parameter count dependence is only one part of the puzzle that we've all been focusing on. Um, and Looking ahead, we must also focus on developing bounds that have at least a sensible dependence on the training set size. So that was our first finding. What, what is our second finding? We show that uniform convergence can provably fail to explain gener generalization in certain situations. And we do this by constructing a specific setup uh, where if you were to train a deep network, the network is going to generalize well. But at the same time, any uniform convergence bound will boil down to a vacuous quantity. Um, and I must highlight here that it is not just the uh, naive uniform convergence bounds, but also bounds that are refined by incorporating the algorithm and the data distribution into it. So even those bounds are going to fail. So uh, let me quickly summarize the setup. So let's say you have two hyperspheres uh, in 1,000 dimensions, and you want to classify them. First, as you can see here, the test error does improve with the training set size and decreases to smaller and smaller quantities. At the same time, to show that uniform convergence fails, we will um, we'll do the following. We'll first take the each point in the training set and project it onto the opposite hypersphere. Let's call this data set S prime. And first, we'll observe that S prime is completely misclassified by the network. Even though it on random test data sets, it's going to perform very well. So intuitively, what this means is that on one hand, the network performs really well on the training set. At the same time, it has somehow memorized the locations of the training data set in a way that it misclassifies um, S prime, which is just as large as the training set. And then, because of this, we mathematically show that this implies vacuous uniform convergence, uh, even for the more refined uniform convergence bounds. So the takeaway, the intuitive takeaway here is that the decision boundary in deep learning uh, tends to have certain kinds of complexities in it. And these complexities can affect uniform convergence, 
uh, making it even fail in certain situations without affecting the generalization error. And our theories must somehow take into account that this is happening. So uh, those are the two findings. And in conclusion, what we have shown is that uh, we, have, we have shown two findings which cast doubt on the power of uniform convergence to explain generalization in deep learning. And looking ahead, we believe that we should go beyond uniform convergence, at least as it is currently applied, or even explore other kinds of uh, learning theoretic tools like stability uh, and, the, and other tools that was uh, described in the previous talk. So uh, that's about it. Uh, there's a poster outside. I think it's still there despite the rain. Uh, yeah, but feel free to ask me any questions during the poster session. Thank you. Um, I'm Pleetham, and I'll be talking about our work on deep double descent, which is an extension of the double descent phenomena that Misha presented. And this is joint work with Gal, Yamini, Tristan, Boaz, and Ilya. Okay, so first, we show that uh, double descent continues to hold even for modern neural network architectures and training procedures. So for example, if we take ResNet 18 and vary the model size on the x-axis, by scaling up the number of convolutional channels in each layer. Now let's take all these networks and train them on CIFAR 10 with 10% added label noise and plot the test error of the resulting classifiers as the solid blue line. And we see it undergoes double descent uh, over increasing model size. And moreover, the peak of test error occurs right around the interpolation threshold, which is right when these models become big enough to just barely fit the train set. So this dashed blue line is the train error. Now, the really interesting thing is this phenomenon appears to be much more general than we first thought. So let's take the same experiment and look more closely. Now let's plot the test error of these models as a function of both model size on the x-axis and number of train steps on the y-axis. Okay? So each column here is looking at the test error of a fixed model over, over the course of its training. Now, the topmost horizontal slice of this plot corresponds to model-wise double descent in the sense we saw before. So this co corresponds to training models of increasing size for the fixed large number of train steps. And we can see double descent here where the test error starts high, then goes lower, then gets high again, and then finally descends. Okay? But looking at this plot, we can see a new kind of double descent, which is epoch-wise double descent. In particular, if we look at the test error of a large model over the course of its training, then this test error starts high, gets lower, then gets higher, and then descends again. Okay. And moreover, this peak of high, of high test error still occurs at the interpolation threshold. So let's look at the train error of these models um, on the left here. So this contour corresponds to the point when the model and the training procedure are just barely able to fit the train set, okay, to close to zero train loss. Now if we look at this contour on the right plot, which is the test error, we see it corresponds almost exactly to this ridge of high test error. So the point is that when the models become just powerful enough to fit the train set, we have high test error, and this holds for more than just increasing model size. In particular, it holds for almost any natural way of crossing this interpolation threshold. You always get this peak. And this phenomenon is actually more general than even this plot shows. Um, and I wasn't going to talk about this, but since there were some questions about complexity, let me actually uh, t just discuss how we propose to unify this. So we, actually, we have a notion of model complexity in our paper that unifies both of these kinds of double descent and even more kinds of double descent. Um, and we say that both all of these forms correspond to increasing complexity uh, in the appropriate sense. 
So what is the, what is the sense of complexity that we propose? Let's, let's consider a training procedure as something that just takes in n samples and spits out a classifier, okay? Now, define the effective model complexity of a training procedure as the maximum number of samples from a distribution that the training procedure is able to fit to very small train loss. Okay, does that make sense? So you have, you have a black box that takes in samples and that puts a classifier. The effective model complexity of the procedure with respect to the distribution is the maximum number of train samples that it can fit to low loss. Okay? Now the generalized double descent hypothesis is that we observe double descent with respect to increasing effective model complexity. And you can increase the model complexity in different ways. You could uh, fix a very large number of train steps and increase the model size. Or you could fix a large model size and increase the number of train steps. Both of these are like smooth ways of increasing model complexity in terms of the number of samples that your procedure can fit. Okay, does that make sense? Um, cool, okay, so a bit more. Um, so all the formal definitions and the more general hypothesis are in the paper and or you should talk to us uh, here. Um, okay, so in terms of epoch-wise double descent, we see different behaviors depending on the size of the model. So if you look at a very small model over the course of its training, a model which is not able to fit the train set, then the test error decreases monotonically over time. Now for intermediate sized models, which are just barely able to fit the train set, the test error first decreases and then increases at the end as it starts to overfit. Now the really interesting thing is for very large models, which are able to fit many more samples, test error undergoes double descent, where it first decreases in the beginning of training, then it starts to overfit, and then somehow training longer corrects this overfitting and test error goes back down again. Completely open when this happens, yeah. Uh, good. So this holds uh, in the in, in the paper we've done. So this particular experiment is for a is for SGD with a one over square t learning rate schedule. Epochwise double descent holds even with a constant learning rate schedule. It holds with atom. It holds with momentum with weight decay. There are a lot of experiments in the paper. It, it, this is like fairly universal. It happens every, everywhere we've, we've tried. Yeah. Uh, not consistent good. Good. So why right. So why is this not consistent? So okay. Well, okay. Good. Uh, one, okay. Um, so. This, the effect of double descent, so okay, so the general claim of the, the general claim is that weird things happen when we're in this critical regime, okay? When, uh, when the model and the training procedure is just barely able to fit the train set. And sometimes this, this weird thing might manifest as a, as a peak in test error. And in particular, the peak is accentuated with added label noise. So in these experiments, we've added label noise, but we do have a peak even in clean settings without label noise. Um, and I think label noise here is a proxy for like increasing the increasing the amount of model misspecification in the distribution. Okay, so so to, so to come back, I guess the the general phenomenon that weird behavior occurs in the critical regime is universal. Now, what this what how this behavior manifests depends on aspects of the problem, and in particular, it's especially strong in settings with label noise. Yeah. Sorry. Right, so okay, so um, for model-wise double descent, we do have settings where we see the same plot without label noise. Now, um, for epoch-wise double descent, it's, uh, we've only observed it in settings with label noise, but it's unclear if this is fundamental. And uh, I suspect it won't be, just because, uh, like for example, you can have label noise that's pseudo-random, so the Bayes optimal is still 100%, but if, if the noise is pseudo-random with respect to the classifier, then you'll still get. Like basically, I don't think the noise is actually changing anything fundamental about the problem, it's just making the problem harder. Um, okay, we can, we can come back to that. Let me just get through this. I'm, I, I can also like, follow up. Um, uh, let me just see. Okay, uh, if, uh, let's see what double descent tells us about increasing, increasing the number of samples. Okay? Uh, so this is the same kind of plot as before, where we plot the test error as a function of model size. Um, and the lines of different colors correspond to increasing the size of the data. And now we see that as we increase the number of train samples from the light green to the dark purple, two things happen. First, generally, test error gets lower since uh, having more samples should help you, but also the interpolation, the peak in test error shifts to the right because it's harder to interpolate more samples. Um, okay, let me wrap up. Basically, a, this combination of two effects gives a regime where training on more data could actually hurt, and we see this in transformers. And in particular, it's open to characterize, um, in theory, when more data could help or hurt. Uh, and I think this has lots of lessons for theory, but I should wrap up, so I'd happy, be happy to um, talk about this uh, offline, and a lot of us are here at the workshop. Okay, thanks. Uh, post papers there, and we're also at the post session.
put this one in the pocket, put it in the pocket, whatever is easy. I'm going to put one like this in this pocket. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Xiao Wu. Today I'll talk about the large batch SGD and uh, from the mathematical point of view. So a uh, reca uh, quick recap of large batch SGD, we use a mini batch to calculate the gradient and the, the large batch like choose 10% uh, of uh, uh, total samples to calculate gradient. Uh, the small batch, however, use uh, like 64 samples every time. So the empirical works have shown that small batch is significantly better than large batch in terms of generalization. And uh, to explain the phenomenon, there are hypotheses to re relate with the geometry of the uh, landscape. So the, in the CASCA uh, 2017, it uh, says a large batch will converge to the sharp minimum. And uh, the sharp minimum generalized was uh, empirically. And uh, in this talk, I will focus on the first part. That is that true that large batch will converge to sharp minimum? So the approach we take is uh, studying the continuous system uh, using the SDE. Uh, benefit of the SDE modeling is we have a complete information of the distribution. Uh, specifically, we can study the PDF of the SDE solution, which is, mod which is characterized by the focal plank uh, nonlinear partial differential equation. So for example, it is very clear that the GIF term for the focal plank equation of the uh, mini batch SGD is not equal to the gradient of the uh, risk. So that is explicit, shows the regularization effect introduced by uh, stochastic SGD. So back to the geometry of the SDE update, uh, we can see like from two points of view. First is in finite time, another is in asymptotic time. From the finite time, we think about the escaping time for a large batch SGD. If it's at the neighborhood of a sharp minimum, then it is easy to analyze that it will take exponentially time to escape the sharp minimum. So uh, empirically, we can see that stuck at the sharp minimum because it takes exponential time <coughs> to escape. So for, for, from the asymptotic point of view, if we have resource to train the algorithm to infinite time, what will happen? And uh, the results show that actually SGD will always go to the flatter minimum, regardless of the batch size. So no matter small batch or large batch, it always go to flatter minimum. But the thing is the convergence rate are different. The small batch go to flat minimum much faster than, uh, than, big, than large batch SGD. So this is a simple uh, experiment on amnesia data. The black curves are small batch and the red curves are the large batch. So the small batch converts to flatter minimum much faster than red uh, curves. So from the uh, uh, finite time point of view, if we truncate that at a finite time, we can see most of the large batch uh, stuck at a sharp minimum because it's converted to flat minimum much slower. So this type of analysis based on the SDE can be extended to other very uh, variants of SD, F, SGDs. For example, the uh, SGD with momentum can be analyzed uh, similarly with additional term to count the friction uh, introduced by the momentum. So in particular, uh, it can be seen that the SGD with the momentum can accelerate the convergence rate and the uh, 
the mini batch kind of accelerates uh, the convergence rate compared to GD. So there are two like accelerations. Okay. So here is a, a quick uh, proof sketch. So to do such like S the type of analysis, we do like two steps. First is uh, define some uh, new energy norm for, to trace the SGD update, to trace the uh, trajectory, and then using the Poincare inequality, which can help to uh, write down the explicit convergence rate. Okay, to sum up, uh, the result here basically shows from the uh, PDE point of view it can see that large batch uh, not only kind of stuck at a sharp minimum, it kind of uh, converge to flat minimum slower compared to small batch. And uh, that, uh, that's, uh, that's a all, all, all talk. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah, question? You are assuming that the nose is the appropriate instance everywhere, right? Oh, sorry. You mean the linear rate? No, the, the noise is Oh, there's a noise, yeah. The noise as assume as as yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh yes. Oh uh, yes, yeah, so 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 it can be like stand to like non syntropic cases like uh, for the NAS, uh, so ma mathematics speaking can, can work out, and, uh, uh, but it's much more complicated than this one. So. so are your results valid since it's not realistic? For the? You assumed isotropic noise. Oh, right. So here's the, for the uh, simplicity of expression, but for the non isotropic case, it can be worked out uh, similarly. So. For the non isotropic case, so there will be like, uh, so yeah, we, 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 we're working on that and we get the result. Yeah, so it's a bit. The vet, yeah. Oh, yeah, so there are some, yeah, yeah. Well, in, in general, in general, it, it won't be the. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. so yeah. Yes. So uh, right. So uh, yeah, we we can uh, I can catch it with you later. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Can you put this in the pocket or yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so uh, I'm Wei Jie, and uh, I'm from Penn. And uh, in this talk, we will introduce a phenomenon we term local elasticity uh, in neural networks. And this is a joint work with a student uh, called Han Feng. Uh, from PanCS. So there are three different uh, classes in ImageNet, but certainly the two classes are very similar to human beings. And uh, our question is, can new networks automatically distinguish, tell that these two, two images are similar and uh, they are different from the last one? This is not uh, trivial, because in terms, for example, in terms of Euclidean distance, um, the two cats are even far away. So this is our question. Most specifically, imagine that we run SGD on the type cat. Then the weights will be updated, so to change the prediction everywhere. So our, our, our question is, the prediction change on tiger cat and the, the prediction change on fighter aircraft, which one is larger, which one is smaller? So intuitively speaking, probably it will change uh, less on the plan because the plan is far away. This is consistent with our wisdom. For example, does uh, learning French affect my English? 
it was said yes by my former advisor, Emmanuel Candice, because the two languages are very similar. Then how about learning Ch Ch French will affect my Chinese? Probably not, because the two languages are completely different. So this really depends on how different the objects are. So let's imagine two possibilities. The first possibility is, pre is perhaps the linear regression. I update one point using SGD at x and I see the prediction change at x prime. They are far away. Due to the leverage effect in linear regression, the change will be more dramatic if x prime is even far away from x. And there's another possibility in terms of nonlinear classify. The change at x prime is almost zero, very small. So which is the case for deep learning? So our question. And this is our hypothesis. Our hypothesis is that deep learning is this category. Deep learning has local elasticity. So this term has two parts. Let me pass this uh, one by one. First, locality. What does locality mean? Locality means that if I update at x, then the change at x prime will be small if x prime is far away. And what is elasticity? Elasticity means that it's not like near, nearest neighbors. In deep learning, we believe that the change will be smooth. It will, it will be smooth instead of abrupt uh, drop uh, suddenly. So this is the elasticity part. So now let's define the relative change. So at W is the weight, and the R update at X get W prime. And this is the relative change. The numerator is the difference of the prediction for X prime. Let's say it's the, it's the plan. And the denominator is the change at the original X, the tabby cat. And let's consider the ratio. And uh, which W, the definition depends on the weights, right? Our simulation shows that it would be best if the W is almost optimized instead of the random IID weights. So our simulation shows that the change, it, it confirms our belief that the change at the target cat is much larger than the change on the plan. So we do more simulations, and all the simulations confirm our local elasticity hypothesis. So there are some curves on, two tor on a torus, and this is two boxes. And uh, here, the geodesic distance is the distance between uh, two points on the blue curve. And uh, this is a relative similarity defined earlier. So roughly speaking, we see that for deep learning for, with ReLU um, connect activation, if the distance is far away, the change will get smaller. And which is not the case in this, if the network, if the network is a linear classifier where the activation is identity. We don't see such phenomenon in linear classifiers. So there's a connection to neural tangent kernel, which is very simple. Actually, we just do Taylor expansion, and finally, the change at x prime is basically proportional to the inner product between the two vectors. The vector at x prime and the vector at x. And this is precise, almost the definition of neural tangent kernel if we let the weight to be ID and the weights are infinitely wide, right? So then this motivates us a new definition. The definition is this, okay? And the two definitions are basically equivalent. So the neural tangent kernel interpretation is profound in the following sense. We believe that the two cats, the tangent, the, the vector, are almost parallel to each other, so, so that their inner product is huge. And uh, whereas the, the, the vector is almost perpendicular to the cat, to cat here. So, so that's why the change here does not affect too much as a plan. Okay? So roughly speaking, if I understand tabby cat more, it will also improve my understanding of the tiger cat, which is not the case for the plan. So we can come up a clustering algorithm by leveraging local elasticity. Roughly speaking, we are provided with the mammal class, but we don't know which is cat, which is dog. But we can train mammal and the vehicle, which is auxiliary data set, and then we can construct a similarity matrix between any point from the memo class. And uh, so this is the, our algorithm. And finally, uh, so this is the result and on, on the MNIST. For example, if we want to distinguish between digit four and the nine, and we use the auxiliary examples, which are five and the seven, and we can get this, uh, for example, accuracy. And this in turn, uh, 
support our hypothesis of local elasticity. So uh, a little bit of things, something fun. And uh, is there anything other thing else which is also locally elastic? Yes, our best, our childhood best friend, which is uh, plasticity. Okay, if each time we push and it will change the shape locally, but uh, it will also affect something nearby in, in an elastic uh, fashion. So finally, we get something done. So this is something uh, perhaps is deeply really this, this case. I don't know. Okay, so our slogan is that neural networks are locally elastic and uh, learning type B cat can improve my understanding at another cat, but not something far away. And, uh, but we just no mathematical foundation. Can we develop it? I tried very hard, Pro uh, no progress yet. I believe that we probably need some tools, advanced tools from low dimensional topology, dynamical systems, and differential geometry to make it a solid foundation for it. And uh, in the paper, we provide some implications of the local elasticity <laughs> on memorization, stability, and the data normalization. And then please uh, take a look at our paper. And uh, thanks, thanks. <laughs>